And now may we read together the Word of God as it's found in the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. May we hear the Word of our God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and forfeited beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And may God speak to our hearts and minds this day through this His holy word, and may His name ever be praised. Amen. A hundred and some years ago, a skeptic by the name of Volney wrote a famous work entitled Volney's Ruins. He, along with Dupuy and Bailey and a number of French skeptics, gathered together a collection of all of the various ancient mythologies of the various peoples of the world and demonstrated that these showed a remarkable and astounding correspondence to the teachings concerning Christ and his salvation. Now, they said, since these mythologies, which often involved interpretations of the constellations of the zodiac, since these very clearly long antedated the revelation and coming of Christ into the world, it was obvious to them that Christianity was nothing more than a borrowing from pagan mythology, dressing it up in Hebrew dress and pawning it off on a credulous world. Thus, there were many were led to a deeper examination of this and uh, to some rather remarkable findings. One of those conclusions was the fact that none of these skeptics were able to tell whence came these ancient mythologies and particularly this understanding of the signs of the zodiac, the constellations of the sky, which seem to be the same whether we go to Egyptian or Greek or Roman or Persian, Arabic, whatever source we go to, Indian or Chinese, the same signs were held throughout the world. Where did they come from? Well, these scholars discovered that the fact is that we cannot ascertain their antiquity, that the farther back we go, they're still there, and they're always there, and the earliest recorders of them are recording something which happened prior to their time. This, by the way, can be ascertained because of something which is known as the precession of the equinoxes, the fact that the stars change and shift in the sky over the centuries, it leads 
enables astronomers to know when a person is describing what is happening in the sky. And the earliest recorders of this are describing something that happened prior to their day. And therefore, it is seen that from the very earliest days of mankind, these stars and these signs have been known. Now it's interesting again that the signs bear little or no resemblance to the stars in the heaven. That is, if a hundred people were to go out and name the uh, constellations, they would not come up with the pictures that uh, have been given to them and have been held by people all over the world. Where did they come from? Well, the Arabic tradition is that they came from, from Seth and from Enoch. This is the same tradition that the Greeks have. Only the Greeks knew Enoch, called him Atlas. This is the same tradition of the Egyptians, only they knew Enoch as Hermes. But all of these go back to the grandson of Adam and say that Enoch and his father Seth were the founders of this ancient understanding of the heavens. Now, therefore, what we see is the fact that God has given from the very beginning a story of his salvation from which all ancient mythologies and ancient traditions have come and that they are describing the salvation which would be wrought by Christ which was given by God to Adam in the Garden of Eden which is as we were told before called the Proto-Evangelium or the first evangel, the first gospel which was that the seed of the woman would destroy the seed of the serpent. And uh, this was the very beginning of the revelation of Jesus Christ to the world. So we see that, the, again, the efforts of the skeptics to try to make Christianity in, into something which is simply borrowed from paganism has failed. Another question that this study answers is questions about such texts as we read today, which tell us that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are plainly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. And even further, in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, in the 17th verse, we read this, So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the end of the world. Their words, or rhema, or rhemata in plural, their teaching, which is what it means, their instruction, their message, went into all of the world. And that message is found in the star pictures, the gallery of the heavens which God gave. And we see that this is something which has actually been given by God. Job tells us that by his spirit, in Job 26, 13, by his spirit he hath garnished, that is made bright or beautiful, garnished the heavens, and his hand formed the crooked or fleeing serpent, one of the largest of the constellations in the uh, zodiac, in, in the skies, is called the crooked or fleeing serpent. And the Bible says that God's hand formed this. Obviously, God formed the stars into whatever positions they are, but moreover, he formed and gave the symbol or signification of it. We're told in Genesis that God put the stars in the heavens for signs, and these signs convey a message and that God has revealed that message to Adam and to his sons and grandson, and that message has gone into all of the civilizations of the world and has passed down through the centuries. At, at uh, the time of the building of the Tower of Babel, this was corrupted into astrology, whereby instead of these being signs of God and his salvation, whereby we should worship God, they were changed into deities themselves and people began to worship the host of heaven, the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars. This, by the way, 
Which, in case you don't know, that to the ancients there were five planets that were visible to the naked eye. There still are. And those, of course, are Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And uh, then, of course, the two largest heavenly bodies, the sun and the moon. Now it is from those five planets and the sun and the moon that we get our names for the seven days of the week, which were all names of ancient pagan gods, which were worshipped by pagan people. And so they worship the host of heaven. Now we have seen that the Bible condemns astrology very, very strongly. And uh, if you remember or look in Isaiah chapter 47, you will see a very strong condemnation of the whole matter of astrology. In Isaiah <clears throat> chapter 47, he says this in verse 13, Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be as stubble, the fire shall burn them, they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. So we see that the Bible condemns this heathen astrology. Instead of being simply the story of Christ, People took them to be deities which have an influence on our lives. Now today, this is covered over and it is supposedly the stars themselves that are exerting some influence upon our lives. This is utterly absurd. They, they try to give some meaning to this or some believability to it by saying that the moon influences the tides and it influences people's emotions, which is absolutely true. But the moon is 250,000 miles or slightly less away from the earth. Whereas we have stars that are 6,000 light years and more away from the earth. And a light year is three and a half trillion years. That's 19 and a half quadrillion miles away. A figure which is so vast it is really beyond our comprehension. The stars do not exert any influence upon us and the deities that they supposedly represent are but the figments of people's imaginations. And so the Bible condemns astrology and it says that we are not to consort with these people, we are not to consult them, to have nothing to do with this. And yet behind all of that there is this great revelation of God and uh, of his glory and of his salvation. In what has come to be known as the zodiac. This is often described as a circle of animals, but that's not really what the word means. It comes from a primitive root, zoad, which comes through the Hebrew sadi, and in Sanskrit means a way, a step, a path. It is the path or the way, and it is the way of salvation which is being revealed in the heavens. It's uh, interesting to see the history of this description to mankind. Eudoxus, in, uh, who lived from 403 to 350 BC, wrote a very famous work upon the heavens, which is called Phenomena. And uh, this described all of the constellations and the, the figures of the heavens. And Antigonus Gonatus, who was the king of Macedon, requested the famous poet Aratus to put the work of Eudoxus into the form of a poem, which he did in 270 BC. And this is called Diosemea, which means the divine signs. Interestingly, Aratus was a native of Tarsus. And his famous poem, Diosemea, the divine signs, was the most famous and most popular Greek poem next to the famous poem, two poems of Homer. And it's interesting that this poem, which is a description of all of the signs of the heavens, of the zodiac, is quoted in the New Testament. I wonder how many of you knew that. This is quoted in Acts 17:28 where Paul says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And that is a quote.
from this great poem of Aratus, who comes from the same town of Tarsus that Paul came from. And just a few lines later, Aratus says in that same poem, and of course he is attributing all of this to Zeus, who was the head of the Greek pantheon of gods, quote, since he himself has fixed in heaven these signs. And so we see as far back as 270 BC and quoting a work written 150 years before that, that it was believed that God himself had fixed these signs in heaven as some sort of a revelation. Now, if you look at the copy of the, the zodiac that you have been given today, you will see that there are 12 major signs that go around the ecliptic. Now, the ecliptic is the apparent path that the sun travels through the heavens. Now the sun doesn't travel in that circular path, but as the earth goes around the sun, it projects the sun across the heavens and makes it appear to do that. And as we've seen, though today, through many corruptions of this, they began with Aries, the ram or lamb, the ancient zodiacs began rather with Virgo. As we've seen that uh, in the temple of Esna, they have the sphinx with the head of a woman and the body of a lion placed in the zodiac right between uh, these two constellations, Virgo and the lion, looking at the woman and the tail pointing at Leo the lion, indicating the place of actual beginning. So, and in addition to the 12 major signs, there are also 36 decans, that's D-E-C-A-N-S, which comes from an ancient root, dec, which means a piece, from the Semitic deca, which means to break in pieces, from which we get the word dec, D-E-C-K, a piece of a ship. And these are pieces of the monthly house, as each uh, of this entire 360 degrees is divided, divided into 12 houses or mansions, as we've seen from Psalm 19, these are mansions or tabernacles for the sun to go through as he runs his race and goes about the circuit or circle of the skies. There are the main 12 major signs and then there are the 36 decans or minor signs that are connected with each of these houses. So let's begin with the first house, which is Virgo. And <clears throat> Virgo, as we mentioned rather briefly and last time, and we'll spend a little bit more time on it today as we look at this first house or mansion of the zodiac. Virgo, of course, is a picture which is down on the right-hand side of, of your picture of this, on the lower right-hand side, of a woman reclining. And uh, she is a woman that has in her right hand a branch and in her left hand she has sheaves of corn. In Hebrew she is called Bethula, which means virgin, even as Virgo from Latin means virgin. And everywhere her name is the same. She is called the Virgin. And we are again reminded of the Proto-Evangelia, that the seed of the woman and of the great text in Isaiah 7:14, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. And uh, this is, of course, the great picture of Mary, the virgin mother of Christ. Aratus, in 270 BC, in one of his lines says, Beneath Boote's feet the virgin seek. So everywhere in every language it is very clear that this is not merely a woman, but this is a virgin. And uh, you will see that right beneath the feet of the constellation Boötes, you will find the virgin. And the meanings of these can be determined from the names that are given to them, from the actual picture itself, and from the names of the stars. And you will remember that the Bible says that God named the stars, and these names come down to us from great antiquity, from the, from the Arabic or the Persian, the Egyptian, these names of the Hebrew are given to us, and from the stars and the pictures and the names of the constellations we can gather the meaning. In one hand there is a branch, and we realize, we remember that 
a number of times in the scripture Jesus is called the branch. <clears throat> he shall come forth whose name is the branch. <clears throat> and that is one of the common names in the Old Testament for the coming Messiah. On the other hand, there are the sheaves of corn, reminding us of the fact that it is the seed of the woman. And Jesus used that figure, the seed of corn, which, unless it fall into the ground and die, remains alone. So we have a twofold testimony. The virgin is going to bring forth the branch, which will be the seed of the woman. And uh, also, I think, uh, confirmatory of this, that the brightest star in Virgo, which is seen in one of her hands, is called Al-Zimak, which means in Arabic, the branch. And this is the picture of the coming of Christ. And so, for the major uh, sign, the first in the first house or mansion, but let's look now at the three decans or other pieces of that house. The first one is called Coma. And you'll find it, some of these are, are inside of the circle and some on the outside. This is right to the left of her shoulder. We see there a woman sitting in a chair holding a child in her arms. And uh, here we have an interesting example of how these have been corrupted in a few cases down through the centuries. This coma means the desired one, and it talks about the desire of all nations who should come about Jesus Christ. But if you look at modern star maps of this, you will not find a woman with a child. What you'll find is a woman's wig. Well now, how did that happen? To find out, you have to go all the way back to a certain queen by the name of Berenice, who was the wife of Ptolemy III, king of Egypt in the third century BC. And her husband went out on a dangerous expedition, and she made a vow to Venus that if he returned alive and in health, she would devote or give her magnificent head of hair to Venus. Uh, and he did return, and she did have her hair, her locks clipped and hung up in the temple of Venus, where they subsequently were stolen, or whether where her wig was stolen. However, a certain famous Egyptian astronomer by the name of Conan, C-O-N-O-N, who lived from 283 to 222 BC in Alexandria, Egypt, gave it out that Jupiter himself had taken this wig and had made it into a constellation now called Coma Berenice, because the word desire is very similar to the word Come, which means the hair the hair of Berenice. But is, if you go back to any of the ancient uh, zodiacs prior to the third century BC, you'll find nothing about a wig, but rather you will find what you see here, a woman seated upon a chair holding a child in her arms. Interestingly, that even Shakespeare knew the real meaning of that, which I think is fascinating that he would have had that incredible scholarship that he had because he talks about, in Titus Andronicus, he talks about shooting an arrow up into heaven unto, quote, the good boy in Virgo's lap. And uh, the Arabian astronomer, Albumazer, one of the great gatherers of all of the ancient knowledge about astronomy that has come down to us today, he said, quote, there arises in the first decan, as the Persians, Chaldeans, Egyptians, and the two Hermes and Ascalius teach, it's interesting that he talks about the first decan here, a young woman whose Persian name denotes a pure virgin sitting on a throne nourishing an infant boy. The boy, I say, having a Hebrew name by some nations called Iesu, which in Greek is called Christos. Now that was a statement made by a non-Christian Arabian astronomer of the 8th century named Albumazer. So here we have a picture of a woman nourishing a child in the first decan 
coma, the desire of all nations who should come, the desired one, which is what is meant by that. So we see Virgo who is going to bring forth the seed, and now that seed is seen to be an infant son who is named Iesu or Christos. The second decan is the centaur, which is found outside of the circle in the far right-hand corner, the bottom right-hand corner of the picture before you. And you see here the picture of the centaur, part horse and part man. And we are reminded here of the fact that this one who was to come who was first prophesied as the seed who was come, was to come and then is seen as the infant boy being nourished in the lap of the virgin is now a man, but he is a very unusual man. He is a man having two natures, part man and part horse. The Hebrew name for this is bize, which means the despised one. And Isaiah 53 uses this term twice. It says, he is despised and rejected of men. He was despised and we esteemed him not. In the Greek myth, centaurs were heaven begotten. They were born of the clouds. They were sons of the gods, but they were hated and abhorred by both gods and men. They were combated and driven to the mountains and finally exterminated. Does that, and you, you have to see here that the original meaning of this as it has gone out and combined itself with the ignorance and the mythology and the paganism of the various peoples becomes corrupted but the original meaning still shines through. <clears throat> the most famous and the head of all of the centaurs in Greek mythology was called Chiron, C-H-E-I-R-O-N. Now Chiron was renowned for his hunting, for medicine, for music, for teaching, for prophecy. He was immortal, but he voluntarily agreed to die and transferred his immortality to Prometheus. And here we see a picture of Christ, who was the great teacher, the great healer, the great prophesier, who, though immortal, gave up his life and transferred his immortality to others. A picture of the Christ who was to come. But you notice that he is going forth as a hunter, and with a spear, he is slaying a victim. Now, I don't want to go into this in any detail, but in that whole little triangle of constellations in the corner there, you'll see that he is spearing in the heart uh, a beast which he was called the victim. And uh, we'll see later, this is part of another house, the, the real meaning of this, that Christ is here slaying a victim. And also you'll see between the legs of the centaur, a very famous constellation, one that does look somewhat like the sign, and that is the Southern Cross, that all of this is right over the cross. That we knew that Jesus Christ, according to prophecy, the Jews knew that he would be a great high priest who would offer a sacrifice. But we'll come to find that, that this victim is also a picture of Christ. So here we find Christ slaying himself as a victim over a cross. And yet, is that not what we have in the scripture? No man taketh my life from me, for I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. Did not Jesus Christ, as the great high priest, offer himself as the final evening sacrifice? And here we have an incredible confirmation of all of this done 
over the cross where the two natures of Christ are seen in the slaying of the, the victim, the sacrifice for the sins of man, the despised and rejected one. And then we come to the final decan, which is Boutes, which is right next to Coma, inside the circle, alongside of the legs of Virgo. And you'll notice if you look carefully there that it's a picture of a man who is moving forward, as you can tell from the way his legs are placed, that he is coming forward rapidly. In one hand, he holds a spear. In the other hand, over his head, he holds a sickle. Now, what is this a picture of? The name Boutes comes from the Hebrew word Bo, which means to come. He is the coming one. Another name for this constellation is Arcturus, which means he cometh. The Egyptians called him Smat which means one who rules, subdues, and governs. And so we see that this Savior comes now to rule, to subdue, and to govern. He comes as a great conqueror. In his head is a star beta, the astronomers call it, but the name of it is Nekar, which means the pierced. So here we see that the pierced one is coming to be the judge and conqueror and harvester of the earth. In Revelation 14, 15, we have a picture of Christ coming to judge the world and in his right hand he has a sickle, a sharp-edged sickle with which he is going to harvest the earth and bring forth men and women unto the final judgment. Therefore, let's look and see what we have in summary in this first book of the 12 books of the Zodiac. And you'll notice that in all of this, what we have is a great celestial preaching of the gospel. We have, first of all, the woman promised in the Proto-Evangelium, the seed of the woman who is going to destroy the seed of the serpent. We have Virgo, the virgin woman, holding the branch and the seeds in her hand. We find next to her is Coma, the desired one, the desire of all nations who shall come, who is now an infant being nourished in her lap. And thirdly, we see him grown to manhood, a very unusual man, however, one with two natures, one who is the great hunter, teacher, physician, and one who gives his life voluntarily and conveys his immortality to others. One who is the great high priest slaying the victim over the southern cross. And finally, we see him also full grown, coming mightily and in power and rapidly as Boutes, the coming one, the ruler, the governor, the harvester of the earth, coming in judgment to harvest the world with a sickle in his hand. So we see in this first volume a preview or overview of the entire message of the scripture, even as in Genesis we have an overview of the whole message of salvation, so also we have in this first book of the heavenly proclamation of the gospel a picture of Christ in his prophesied coming as the seed of the virgin, in his birth and nativity, in his suffering and priesthood, and finally in his coming in glory and judgment as the harvester of the earth. The glorious proclamation of the birth, sufferings, and future glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. My friends, I hope that as you go out and look at the starry skies above, you will be impressed anew and afresh. And as we proceed with this series, you will become amazed at the God who hath writ on high these things for all the world to see. For surely his voice hath gone unto the ends of the earth and the invisible things of him 
from the creation of the world are plainly seen as God has placed these constellations, this Maseroth, which he brings forth with his own hand in its season, pictures of the great salvation which he has wrought in Jesus Christ. May we pray. Our Father, we thank thee that thou hast left no one in ignorance. And we thank thee that thou hast given us thy word to make clear again the teaching of thy gospel. But we praise thee that during those many centuries when there was no written gospel, that thou hast not left thyself without witness, but hath proclaimed thy glory and thy salvation in the starry skies above. And we rejoice in that, that thou art the sovereign Lord, who telleth all of the stars, who numbereth them and calleth them by name and bringeth them forth in their order, and hath used them to declare thy glory unto mankind, even the glory of thy gracious salvation through the seed of the woman, our great Savior, Deliverer, and Judge, even Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. My father, the late D. James Kennedy, had a passion for proclaiming biblical truth and applying it to every sphere of life. This ministry continues his unique mission of applying the Bible to important issues while also preaching the gospel and broadcasting it by any means possible. And we continue to make available Dr. Kennedy's messages, which are even more relevant now than when he originally preached them. They're only available from D. James Kennedy Ministries. To find out about other compelling DVD and audio CD sets, MP3s, and other unique resources, please call us at 1-800-988-7884. You can also visit us on our website at truthinaction.org, where you'll find sermons, featured products, DVDs, documentaries, and much more. Check out some of our other high-quality resources designed to give you a biblical worldview so that you can confidently share your faith and influence the culture for Christ. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.